I will have the PureRef file open, but uh, I will be disabling it on the recording so it does not create hindrance to the actual Blender UI. So you won't be seeing it from now on. So let's get into Blender and get started. So first of all, I would like to press N on the keyboard and you'll have this side menu pop up. I will change the focal length to a little bit higher like 80 uh, this helps me this helps me view the viewport this helps me see the viewport a little bit better because now you can zoom in really close and it works perfectly now let's delete the default cube with with left click select and then pressing X to delete it you can use the accent grief button on your keyboard to access this pie menu and you can change the view orientation this way. Now first things first, let us also delete this lamp with X. And we will add some reference images first because uh, re having properly aligned reference images always help. And it will save you a lot of time in your modeling later on. So let's press Shift A, Image, Reference. After selecting from the dialog box and clicking on open, you will have this reference pop up. But if you if you if you look at it, it's available in the perspective view as well, and you can actually see it on both the sides, which is not what we want. So make sure you have selected the image, and then under this property on the right hand side, uncheck display perspective select front for the side options and select the depth as back now we will repeat this for the left hand side i will rotate it by 90 degrees i'm using r and then typing in 90 as you can see that the the orientation and size might not perfectly align so for that purpose what I'm going to do is first I'm going to rotate this along the Y axis with R then Y then I press 90 so now it is aligned to the top view just like the first reference image now while you have that new image selected click use alpha then reduce the opacity then you can see the you can see both the reference images at the same time and then you can scale it up and align it perfectly so that the overall size matches and you can then move it with G once you're done with that let's uncheck this and let's rotate it back to its original position Same for this one, display depth to back, side to front, display perspective unchecked. Now we have the reference images set up. Now you can see that you can click and move them, which we do not want all the time because this will, in, this will be a conflict to editing the actual model. So come here onto the outliner, click on this button, you have this selectable icon there, now you have this alongside the empties just uncheck those and then you will have no control you, you won't be able to select them in the viewport anymore now let's get started quickly let us press shift a mesh plane then I'll use s to scale it and you can actually lock the scaling by pressing s followed by the axis keys like X Y and Z you can go into the edit mode by tab and then you can select individual vertices and the edges and scale them accordingly we are trying to match the shape here you do not need to be 100% precise because this has some lens distortion and perspective going on so it is not perfectly the it's not going to align perfectly with all the views, but you have a general idea. By the way, I'm extruding with E 
and then I'm getting these new edges from the previous ones and scaling them with S. Let's go on to the modifier stack and then I'll add a subdivision surface modifier. Let's set the viewport quality. Let's set the viewport to two levels. And then I'll just try to match this as 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 properly as I can. And then I will be right back. So spend as much time as possible in this part. I'm not uh, going to record these parts where I'm spending a lot of time trying to align them because it is just about uh, spending time and being careful to match the shape. So this is not a very important part. You just need to figure this out and with practice this uh, this will get easier for you and you will, you will be spending less time uh, adjusting and trying to match the shape. Now as you can see that I have completed making further adjustments and I have matched the overall shape of the sole of the shoe. Now I have, you can see that there are new edges here. That's because I've used Control R in edit mode, and then you have this this new loop cut option, and you can use the scroll wheel to add more or less. Then you can click and confirm it. You have to click twice to confirm it, by the way. Now now we have the base. Let's align it to the left hand side. Let's go into the edit mode. Select all with A and I will press G along the Z axis by pressing Z afterwards and then then we are going to align it to the sole properly. Now you can see it is completely flat right now. We do not want that. We would like it to follow this curvature of the sole. For that, you can see that we are in the edge select mode here on the top. Let's switch to the vertex select. Let's go back. Now you have this vertice. Now you, have, you can see the vertices, but there are two vertices and one hides the other one in this view. So make sure you have X-ray on. Then you can drag and select and you will be selecting both of them at the same time. Now let's do one thing. Let's grab them with G and position them accordingly. Now we are done with the curvature. Next thing, we will be extruding this. So while we are still in the edit mode, press A to select all the vertices, press E to extrude, and then you'll have a auto guide to extrude along the normals. So follow that and let's extrude up till the highest point. Click to confirm. Now let us make other adjustments. I have turned on the extra mode and let's shape it. I'm just selecting with box select, click and drag, and then I'm using G to grab it and place it accordingly. By the way, this gray outline is how the mesh will look. You have, to, you have to position the vertices in such a way that this gray mesh follows the actual shape. And that's because we have this subdivision surface modifier here. So if we do not have this on, then it will have followed the vertices. But since we have this on here, so it gets curved because there are actually more uh, faces here which we, are not, uh, which we are not able to see. We can see that with this button. This is how the actual mesh looks. But let's not get into that right now. Let's finish aligning.
Now, double click on the lower loop to select it. I'll select both sides and then complete the selection by selecting them. Now you have the whole lower loop selected. I will press Shift E and drag to add this crease. So let's go to this view, to the left view and press Shift E. Not too much, otherwise it will look unrealistic. All right. And same for these edges so that it follows the form. Not too sharp. By the way, there are hotkeys for everything that I said. You can turn on the X-ray mode using Alt-Z. You can toggle it. And to change from vertex to edge to face select, you can use 1, 2, and 3 on your keyboard. Not the numpad, but over the letter keys. You have the line of numbers from 1 to 0. Use those keys. Let's add more crease here. Now if you see in the reference closely, then the bottom of the shoe has this outline and we are going to do that. For that, press 3, select, select these faces, alright. And you can see that the cursor has been changed to something else. And that's what I used to select them. So this is a circular selection mode. You can activate it by pressing C while in the edit mode. And then right click gets you out of it. Anyways, you could have selected it one by one by shift clicking or also use the box select mode. Anyways, now once you have selected them all, you can press I on your keyboard to inset or you can also right click and do the same. I will drag to have grease right about there. And now we can extrude it with E and push it inside. Now we have that effect. You can play around with the amount of crease we have, but I think it's all right. By the way, I'm getting rid of this overlays using this button here, or you can use Alt Shift Z to toggle it. This might sound overwhelming at first, but if you're pretty frequently using Blender, then these hotkeys will be memorized. Do not, I, I do not recommend you uh, spend too much time memorizing them. Just make sure that you're using the hotkeys instead of the buttons. Make that a habit and then the memorize part will follow automatically. Now I'm just making some fine tuning adjustments. making the shape a little bit more pronounced than the reference because the reference is taken at an angle of course okay not too bad now if you look at the reference once again then you will see there's this crease going on here at this just at the bottom just at the bottom line of the sole which is visible from the from from up from upwards if you know what i mean so we are going to add some loop cuts there remember loop cuts with control r just press that and place it here now if you are unsure of where to place it and you have already added a loop cut then you can instead of pressing g and moving it up which moves the mesh as a whole you can just press G double time that is double tapping G and then you can slide it along the edge that is a much better way of uh, editing loop cuts later on so let us 
let us position it properly first and align it with the reference once again. Now adding this loop has made changes to the sh overall shape so you have to account for that. By the way you can double tap to you can double click to select a loop. Right about there would be fine. Then I'll add another loop here and another one. Then double click to select the middle loop. Then scale it in very slightly to give it the crease. All right, I think that will be fine. I'll go to the top view once again. Switch to face select, press C and select the top faces. Now you can press I to inset again. Not too much this time. and then extrude and push it inside. Actually, extruding will not have the best effect here. So instead we will actually push it inside without extruding and then press, and then press S to scale it, follow it by Z and press zero. What, is, what it is doing is basically flattening out the whole thing. Now you are unable to see it properly, so I will click here and turn it turn on the on cage view. Let's scale it along the Y axis and keep the keep the whole border uniform. push it inside a little bit more you can see that since we have uh, since we insert the faces there we ended up with getting the crease here as well so we have to remove the crease select the edge press shift E and type in minus one this will remove any kind of crease on any edge same for this one Now it's all about adjusting, looking at the actual model and then aligning it likewise. Like we can go into the vertex mode, vertex select mode and push this one, this one's up a little bit here. Actually this part can use a lot of work. If you feel like the view is getting funny, it's like it is not focusing on your actual model but on something else, then you can actually select your model and press that axe engrave button and select view selected. Then it repositions according to the selected item. Just a quick tip there. Now let us make some more final adjustments to match the shape properly.
we are selecting these and pushing them inside because the outer edge got too much thin and sharp unlike the reference so I'm scaling in it I'm scaling them inside so that they are not very close together and it gives some breathing it gives some breathing room to these edges so they are not too sharp Now the sole of the shoe is pretty much complete. Now we will work on the upper part. Let's press shift right click here and the cursor will come here. Now as, as you know that the cursor determines where the new objects will be uh, placed. So, rest, so I want the object to be placed here so I move the cursor. Press shift A and we'll be using a curve here, the Bezier curve and I'll show you how easy it is to set this up using the Bezier curve I'm using G to translate this by the way move this around I'm in edit mode now, selected one handle and I'm rotating with R Then I will bring it to the starting point, rotate the thing a little bit so that it follows this curve, pull it inside, same for this one. You can select the other two points of the handle to change the angle and also more granular control over the curvature. Now select the whole curve using A, right click, subdivide. You have this new one here. Scale it up to give it a broad curvature and I think it will be perfect. We'll be coming back and making more adjustments by the way doesn't have to be perfect at first now what we will do is I think we need to make a little bit of adjustment here there we go now let's go on to the properties on the right side for the curve and you can see you have this geometry drop down just increase the extrude value now you can see that that's really not what we wanted but that's because the curve is not rotated properly so select all of them in edit mode press ctrl T and then as you drag your slider drag drag your mouse pointer then you can set the set the rotation actually the twist of the curve and you can select individual handles and make sure that they are following the actual shape properly. So I'll make more granular adjustments and spend some time here and once it will be done then I can right click and convert to mesh before adding more modifiers to it. 
So I will make the adjustments and then convert it to mesh and come back. By the way, before converting it to mesh, I will lower the resolution to 6 because we'll be adding a subdivision surface modifier later on. So it will be adding more geometry. And I want to make sure that this and the sole have a uniform distribution of geometry so that it can be deformed properly if ever animated. I just want to maintain a good topology here. Now I have converted it to a mesh and I did it with the lowest resolution possible on the curve settings so that I only get this one loop of face, this, this one bridge of faces as you can see. Two loops on two sides and then only one loop of these faces. Uh, so the main reason to keep it low poly is that now we will be using many modifiers. First of all, press Ctrl 1 on your keyboard to add the subdivision surface modifier with a viewport value of 1. Change the render, render value to 1 as well. Now adjust, scale it up a little bit so that it does not intersect with the actual base mesh. Once you are happy and you're sure it's not intersecting, you will add a shrink wrap modifier. Shrink wrap and set the target to the plane, of course, the shoe. Changes to above surface. So we will go into the edit mode, go into object data properties, vertex groups, click here. Let's give it a name. Let's call it hold. And I'll select this final, this, this uh, vertices at the end and click assign. Go back into edit mode, into object mode and on the shrink wrap modifier, you can select hold from the vertex groups. Now you can see that it has kind of like st it is sticking to the base mesh now and only those parts which we selected for the vertex group and then you can also make adjustments to the other to the other vertices Now, before making too much adjustments, I will add the solidify mo modifier here. And the thickness can be used to set the thickness, of course, as you might have guessed. We will add another subdivision modifier. And the reason I'm adding this at the end of all these other modifiers is because after, if we added it in at, at the front like we have done once, then that will be used for the shrink wrap and for the solidify. But once the solidify has been added, then adding the subdivision creates this nice bevel at the end. So you get a better looking mesh with the same amount of geometry. Just a quick little trip there. Okay. Let's set this to shade smooth. I'll go into the wireframe mode with Z and check out how it is looking. Okay. Uh, I would like to add a few edge loops here. Let's add three. Now it looks much more uniform. So as you, can, as you can see that it's intersecting here. So I'll push the actual base, uh, the base mesh inside. Actually, we should make a final adjustment to the base mesh. That is right click. And then if you have this turned on, then turn it off. Then you'll have this really, really high vertices for the front part where the, where this upper part meets the, meets the sole. So these two vertices need to scale it needs to be scaled 
inward a little bit and I'm doing this using S and then selecting X because it's along the X axis and then it will not intersect anymore and since we did that we can also select these two edge loops with double left click and scale them inside as well but don't overdo it just keep referencing the images that are that we are supposed to follow and you'll be all right I can I, like I can see that we missed a few points here and there so I will make the shape meet the reference So as you can see, the lower edges are pretty sharp. We need to add crease here with Shift E. We can create a shrink wrap offset here so that it does not look like it is. It does not have a good finishing like it looks torn up and all that so you can change the offset and make it look perfectly lined up cool now let's reference the image the image once again if you look at the reference properly then you'll see that along the along these white stripes we have a slight elevation. So what we're going to do is we will do this in the modeling in the modeling session itself instead of relying on the um, relying on the shading part of this because it's good to have the bigger details done in the modeling session. So it will be fairly easy to do. Just go into edit mode. I'll switch to uh, the edge select mode. Select these three edges, these edge loops, using double click. I will create a bevel using Control B. Drag. Then you have these bevels here. And right click once again and add edge loops in between them. Select the middle edge loops and again create bevel using control B now you have to press alt E and extrude faces along normals this is a very uniform and nice way to scale the to scale the extruded faces otherwise they go get disproportionate so first you can see that this has really messed up the outline here. The reason is that extra faces has been created. So select the extra faces. Press X to delete the faces. Also you can see that the crease is ununiform. So Shift E minus minus one to get rid of the crease on this side as well now this looks these waves or her stripes what do we want to call them they look pretty rounded that's not what the reference has so i will switch to edge select and select these edges here press shifty 
to add crease. I will dis I will disable the overlay so that I get a nice look of what is going on. And I think the elevation is too much, so I'll I will switch to the face select mode, select these loops, and then I will press Alt S to scale them along the normals. Maybe even less. Now we can we can add a bit of crease here. Now for the grid kind of thing that we have seen in the reference, that is at the bottom of the shoe, what we're going to do is we'll add a plane. So press shift A and scale it so that it is larger than the total size of the actual shoe there. I will grab it and pull it down a little bit along the z-axis. Now follow me here. Add a modifier, subdivision surface. Go into edit mode, right click and add a subdivision by the sub with the subdiv with the subdivide option. Now you can increase this. Switch to simple. Then we need to add the wireframe modifier. As you can see, we have a grid. Now this value here on the viewport controls the density. And make sure you also update the render one, otherwise it will look different in the render in when you render it out. This is the this is the thickness as you might have already noticed. And uncheck even thickness because it might lead to some bugs later on because we'll be using some uh, boolean modifiers with it. Now if you look at the reference closely, then you will see that these are not perpendicular, but rotated at an angle of 45. So I will rotate it by 45 degrees, R, then 45. Just type in 4, four 5 on your keyboard. That's it. Maybe I'll scale it in a little bit. Once you're done with that, I will add a shrink wrap modifier. Use this mesh target pick to pick up this plane. It doesn't look right currently. So I will push the wireframe at the end. So this way you can reorder your modifiers using these arrow keys. So I have placed the wireframe at the end. It still does not look right, but do not worry, we are going to make further changes. Select the base model, the shoe, right, uh, and go into the edit, edit mode. Double click on this loop on the inner edge Duplicate with Shift D and press P to separate. Selection. Now if you go back into object mode, you will see we have this new object here. Tab into edit mode. Select all with A. There's this crease which is not necessary, so just decrease the amount of crease with shift E minus one. Now I will extrude along the Z axis. And I will grab with G and pull it down along the Z axis. Now for convenience, let's go into the viewport display and display as where, because we do not need this to be visible all the time. Also, same as we did with the reference images, let us dis uh, disable the editing in viewport now. Cool. Now go back to the grid. 
under the modifier stack and we will add a boolean modifier. Let me collapse this. Object picker and let's pick this new plane. Actually, since we disabled the viewport selection, we were unable to select it. So I will, I'll, I re-enabled it and I will pick it up again and then disable it once again. As you can see, we are unable to see the grid that we made now, it has vanished. So change this operation to intersect. Now it is back. Just place it before the wireframe. Now it still has some bugs here, stretching and the and the grid exceeds its limits here on the border. So this is because the actual plane is way too much far away from the target. And this is this issue is caused by the shrink wrap modifier. So you just need to go into edit mode and, pu and push it a little bit closer. And then you'll have a clean looking grid. You can even disable viewing this plane in the viewport. And now if you're happy with the density of this, density of the grid, then, then it's all right, but you can change it anytime with this viewport option. And if you see any issues of the border going out of the, going out of place, you can just scale in the boolean object very slightly and it will be solved and the stretching along the border that can be solved by just moving it around a little bit Yeah, so just play around with it for a while and it will get a perfect, a perfectly symmetric grid. So if you look closely in the reference, then you will see that these squares are not very, um, not, not very uniform. It is a bit stretched along one direction. So we will solve that. But before that, I think the thickness is way too much in the wireframe mode, in the wireframe modifier, so I'll decrease that a little bit, slightly. Alright, and then let's go into edit mode, scale along the y-axis by 1.5 times. So just type 1.5, that will do. And now you can see that we have the stretched kind of Now you can see that we have the stretched look. So that's it for the grid. And I think we are done with the modeling now. We can move on to making the materials for it. Now we are going to do the shading for it. First of all, we would like to use some good HDRI images. So head on over to the world properties and under color, click on this button. Then you can switch to environment texture. Click on open and I have some HDRIs here. All of these are from hdriheaven.com. So you can just grab some from there. And I'm going to use this one because it has some overcast uh, skies. So the lighting is uniform, but you can use a studio uh, lighting setup and all that. You can even use lighting within the blender, so within the blender scene, like area lamps or point lamps that will work too but I wanted a uniform looking lighting, so I chose this one. And I do not want to see the background all the time in the render, so I will head on over to the render properties, and under film, you can select transparent, then you only have the object here. 
Now you, we can see that the overall shading of the shoe from the reference image looks like it doesn't have too many different um, shaders, but uh, you can always, but if, if you look closer, then you can see that there are some minor differences like texture is different from here and here and there, the specularity and the roughness are a little bit different. So we'll be uh, accounting for that. So first of all, before getting right into the shading part and fiddling around with the nodes, let us do some demarcation by using viewport colors. So what I mean is that, let us start with this upper part. I will select it and go into materials tab. Let's give it a new material. Let's call it um, red weaving. And click here to add another material slot. Click new, let's call it white, white stripes. Keeping it very literal. Now for the red weaving, let's go down here and under viewport display, you can change the color. So this is not going to affect the final render, but if we, if we switch to solid mode, by the way, I'm using Z to get this pie menu. So under solid mode, you can see if we change the color here, it shows up. So it is just to make sure that we have that, that which material is affecting which part of the model. So just give it that a different color. And same way, let's go to the white stripes and change the color to a bright white. It was already white, so let's not bother with that too much. Now you can see the white stripes is not visible because we have not assigned it to any particular part of the shoe. So let's do that quickly. Select the object and hit tab to go into the edit mode. I'll press 3 to switch to face select. Double click to select these loops. Um, I have pressed the shift button while I did it so that I do not lose the selection and it adds to the previously selected faces. Now if you press control and then the plus key on the numpad, then it will, it will expand the selection. Let's do that. Now, make sure you have selected white stripes and then assign. Then you can see we have a pretty similar looking, a pretty similar looking distribution of the materials. But you might have compared this to the reference image and you have seen that you, you, you should have uh, noticed that the white stripes are too thick. Uh, so, that is because we have the subdivision surface modifier and these edges here are not creased. So let us first select these edges. To do that, we have to switch to the edge select mode and then double click, select both sides of all the stripes, press control E and then you can see giving it a slight amount of crease makes it thinner. And now what we can do that is that we can actually give a slight crease to the lower part of the of this object so that it gives a uniform interpolation and it looks pretty uniform actually because right now some parts of the edges have crease and some do not so it's better to give it a uniform look. Now let's do the same for the other parts of the shoe. For the base, ma for the base of the shoe, the sole, let us give it a new material, and let's call it leather. Another one. Let's call it rubber. Rubber will be for this slight border at the bottom of the shoe, and we'll have another one actually. Let's call it fabric because uh, this behind this grid kind of thing, we have a pretty fabric looking texture. I'm not very sure of what that is, but it doesn't have much roughness and specularity. So I will go a little bit far and make a separate material for that. So let's let us continue 
and mark the shaders. For the leather, for the leather, I'll change the color to blue one. It's not, it's not looking very good together, but our purpose is just to make sure we know which, uh, which part of the shoe has which material. You can make it look beautiful with a better color screen, but I'm not very concerned with that right now. For the rubber, I'll select this loop. Control plus to expand the selection. And then click on the rubber, hit assign, change the color of the rubber to uh, something different. And now for now for the fabric, I'll select this bottom part. By the way, I just used the C selection mode, the circular selection mode using C hotkey. Make sure you're noting those hotkeys so you could habituate it with them. I'll click assign and change the color again. So I think now we are ready to actually give it some, give the materials more detail. Start working with them. I got this texture out uh, off of the internet and it's, it worked pretty well with this, but if you have access to the actual textures, then it's massively much more better. So use whatever best resource you can find. But for this one, I think this worked pretty well. So, Let's get into this. I will start with this one. Select the object and I'll go into the shader editor. You can see here, you can select the slots and also what material it should have. This is the principle to BSDF, which is there by default. We will be using the specular roughness, color, and the normal inputs for this for this project. We are not concerned about the other parts. So I'll press Shift A, texture, image texture, and hit and click open. And then we need to select the texture that we have. Now, if you select this texture and press Control T, then you have a UV texture coordinate setup done automatically. Now plug this color into the base color. Actually, excuse me, we are not plugging that into the base color. The color is going to stay uniform. That is um, the shade of red that we have. We're, I'm coming to that later on. But this color is actually going to be our specular map and normal map. If you are familiar with 3D shading a little bit, then you know what they are. I'm not going to go into much detail, but this is just going to dictate which part of the texture will have what specularity and what roughness uh, for a roughness map and also for a normal map we can use the bump node here so i will show you just that right now press shift a vector bump map for the normal it is similar to a normal map just a little bit different algorithm and then you can plug this into the normal let us go into the rendered mode I will change the distribution to multi scatter and this one to random work this is what I always do because it gives you more realistic results I'll change the color to match the reference a little bit as close as I, as I can you can see that the effect is not very visible that is because we have not mapped the texture properly. You can see that we're using UV here. So we need to UV unwrap this first. I'm going to UV editing, go into the top view, select all with A, press U, unwrap. And then we can scale it up. And then what we're going to do is, we're going to go back to layout now we have it textured properly. Now if we 
preview it, you can see that we have the normal map properly set up. Now it is too strong right now. So what we're going to do is we're go we are going to set the distance to 0 0.01 and the strength lower 0.25, something like that. It looks much better now. Now you can see the specularity is uniform. So we need a specular map to give it more realism. I'll just add a color ramp node and let me show you what I'm doing. I'll just increase the contrast a little bit and then plug this into the specular. You can see that we lost control over how much specular we want overall. So I will use a math node, put it in there, set this to multiply, and then this value will be our specular roughness control. Maybe the contrast is a little bit too much. This will be fine. Perfect. And of course, you can change the roughness from here. Let's set it to 0.4 and decrease the specularity to 0.2. I still think the contrast was way too much. Perfect, just play around with this. Like this has no right or wrong. You just match it with the reference as much as you can. Now let's switch to slot two. For the white for the white stripes it does not have any texture but i will do the regular things to make it a little bit more realistic it seems to be a little bit more realist uh, reflective so i will change the roughness to three specularity i'll keep the specularity at 0.5 looks fine by me let's jump over to the other mesh Let's deal with the leather first. So for the leather, for the leather, you can just follow what I did for this one with the leather texture. If you have, they will give you the specular map. If you are downloading it from a premium site, they will have the premium uh, specular maps and the and the uh, normal maps and everything. So you just need to plug them in like I did without using any color ramp and all that stuff. But uh, I wanted to show you a procedural way of do it of doing it. It's not going to be perfect, so you can always switch back to the image texture method I showed but uh, it's always good to know two different ways of doing stuff so since it is a leather texture which is pretty uh, not very hard to replicate at least to a certain level so i'll show you how to do that i'll input a texture coordinate node with shift a and then i will add a noise texture just follow me here because this is I think it's a bit beyond the scope of this video, but I'll just show you how it's done as an introduction to procedural shading in Blender. So I'm just affecting the texture coordinate of the Voronoi texture with the noise texture. Let me show you what I'm doing. I'll increase the scale. and also the influence of the distortion from the noise texture. I'll increase the detail to 16. The detail to 16, yeah. So that will be, that will be perfect. And then let me show you how it looks on the actual shader. I'll change the color to match the reference again. And then we can use the same method of using a bump node here. Put the normal ins into it and use the distance as the height. You can see it is looking a little bit close to like a leather texture. If you invert this, You will get the uh, you will get a little bit better effect that I've seen from it. Actually, play around, actually play around with the. Actually, you can play around with the invert setting, what looks better for different procedural textures. I think we do not need the invert texture here. 
invert setting here. Anyways, now we can play around with the contrast a little bit using a mix using a RGB curve node. And then you can use this curve to affect how it looks on a greater level of detail. Yeah, so anyways, it looks pretty much similar. Now the now you can use this texture to also make the specular map. So same way we'll be using the color ramp node, adding in the factor. I'll flip this. And again, you do not need to worry too much if you're unable to understand this small details of this, of this procedural texture workflow. You do not need to know that so well, you can just use image texture. I'm just showing you a different way of doing this. Now you can just play around with the settings. I'll change the roughness to 0.4. Let's try this one. This one looks better for the speculator. Anyways, so let's get, let's keep moving on. Now to the rubber, let's switch to slot 2 for the rubber. I will actually go back to slot 1 and copy this color with Control c Come here, paste it, make the same settings for this one too, just without any normal mapping or bump mapping. For slot 3, the fabric one let's do one thing let's go to this object and to the red weaving and i will copy the whole one the whole shader with ctrl c i've selected all the nodes and i'm pressing ctrl c to copy go back to this one slot 3 yep i'll delete this and paste it back in now the only thing we are going to change is increase the roughness all the way up this will be for the fabric. Now you will see, you do not really notice it properly because of, as usual, it's not UV unwrapped. So I will select it and press U to unwrap. Looks much better. If you want more details, you can come back here and change the UV unwrapping. For this one, I would like to increase the strength. It's just a slight hint of having a texture there so that it looks like fabric. Because it's not it's not too much visible from outside. For the lower cage kind of mesh, we will actually use the same material as the as the rubber. Yep. It'll be fine. So we are done with the shading. Now to look it to make it it's already looking pretty close to the reference, but I will go back to the settings for the render. Here is the render settings and render properties. You can enable ambient occlusion and play around with the settings to get some uh, ambient occlusion which makes it look prettier all the time. Also some bloom. Not always, I will but you can have it to make it look interesting. Hint of lighting and reflection. This is the real time render engine EV. So I think we are not going to use any cycles shader here 
it is the same for cycles as for EV because the shader nodes are going to work for both of them with, with a few exceptions, but we have not used those nodes in this project. So if you switch to cycles, you will have pretty much the same look, a little bit more realistic. But what you are, what you can notice is that the reflections are a little bit different. That is because the specular amount and the roughness amount that we saw in the principled BSDF node, they actually do not, they, they have some slight discrepancies between cycles and EV. So you need to adjust them for each, uh, for each render engine. For example, uh, you can increase the specularity here for when you're rendering cycles, but when you go back to EV, uh, you need to decrease the specularity a little bit to make them look the same. So that's something, but I think the EV one looks good enough. You can always tweak around and play around with the roughness and specularity. I think the leather could use a little bit less specularity. Actually, even play around with the roughness a little bit. Just keep making minor changes and all that. By the way, if you're very sure of what the color is, then of course, you can click on this and use ha you have this hex value. You can just paste it in there if you are very sure of the color scheme used for your uh, design of the sneaker. I think it's oversaturated right now. I'll just, you can just decrease the saturation here. Also, another thing I would like to show you is that on, in the render properties, at, at the very end, you have this color management node. No, color management tab. Let's say, let's put it that way. And you can change change the look from here. So you will get different contrast and all that. Um, we are we are currently in the filmic view transform, which is recommended because then you can take this out of Blender and do proper editing. And even in Blender, you can do proper post production because the because the exposure value per pixel is not squished according to your display settings. It's just a raw format to do color grading and all that stuff. So it's always good to do that. You can always use the curves from here and make minor changes while you are viewing it in the viewport itself. So it helps a lot. So yeah, that's it. I will pause the video here. I think we are done with this, sh with this uh, shoe or slider, whatever. Now, before I end this, uh, I want to quickly show you one thing because let's, let's make it a complete tutorial. So I will unhide that Boolean object. Yeah, there we go. Uh, in order to create a separate copy of this, you have to duplicate it with Shift D. You have duplicate copy now. Make sure you have selected everything and duplicated it over if, with, along with the Boolean object so that it does not uh, look weird because we have not applied the modifiers. So you have to keep everything in place in order to make it work. If you want to go into sculpting mode or further editing to individual shoe or to even change the grid a little bit or if you want to do some uh, low level editing, then you have to apply the modifiers from this tab for example, for the grid, you can apply all this and make sure you're applying this from top to bottom. And then you can get rid of, of the Boolean modifier and everything else. Then you can make more uh, detailed editing to each object. So anyways, once you have duplicated this, you can see that it look both the same. And you cannot mirror this. If you mirror this with Control M, it, it will look out of place. It does not right now that much. But if you have too much detail on a shoe, like some shoe eyelets and all that, uh, many small parts going on, then it always tends to look weird. So a better way I have found is that you can just scale it along 
all the axes, which means you just press S, all right? You do not have to lock it to any axis. So press S and then type in minus one. Then it makes a mirror image of it. And you will see that it is not oriented properly. So I will just rotate it along the X axis by 180 degrees. So it will get back to its original place. You can see it has a, made a perfect mirror image of it. And then you can rotate it to like, to make it look a little bit better. You can rotate and all that stuff. Keep it, make it a little bit out of sync. And here we go. We have the two shoes done. Cool. You can make a render now. What I'm doing is I've just pressed accent, accent grave on my keyboard. And then you can switch to view camera. And then press control, then press shift, accent grave, turns on the fly mode for the for the camera. And then like in a game, you can use WASD to navigate the viewport. You can use shift to fast to speed up your movement or alt to slow it down while you're moving. So these are a few tips. So let's make a render. You'll see you, you, you do not have any render buttons here. You just need to go under here and per, and click the render image. You can also press control. You can also press function 12. Since it's a real time engine, you will get it really fast. Now you can see that we have that Boolean object show up. That's because we have only disabled it in the viewport. Where's that Boolean object? Yeah, this one. We have disabled this one and this one in the viewport. But if you render, you still have them. That's because under you can click here, enable this one. And now you have new option to disable or enable this in the render. So you can click them and now they'll be disabled in the render, render too. 